So I'm happy to be here with so many of you who like chemistry a lot. And you know, when I was in ninth class, when I went for my first chemistry lecture, I figured out that that's the subject I want to study. And uh, still now, after some 45 years, I'm still studying chemistry. So I'm one of the lucky people who always had an opportunity to do what I like to do. So I think that's very important to tell you young people here. You please do what you like and you, what you want to do. Don't do something because your parents told you or somebody told you or your friends told you. Whatever you like to do best, please do that. Because only when you do what you like, you can take the ups and the downs as it goes on. It's very, very important. Very happy to see you here today. You might be wondering what chemistry has to do with crystals. But chemistry has a lot to do with crystals. And in fact, I happen to, in my own work, belong to a part of research where chemistry and crystallography come together. It's called chemical crystallography. So it's a subject where you have about some chemistry, some crystallography. And so what I want to tell you is not about chemical crystallography, but about crystals itself. What crystals are. And uh, let's see if this pointer works. So that's a crystal. OK. So what do, you, what do you see in this picture? What do everybody standing next to, next to, next to, next to, next like that? Like how all of you all are sitting in this room. Regular arrangement. There's a big word for that regular, we call it periodic. Regular is the thing. So any crystal means there is some order in it. Hey, you fellows in the last row, you don't talk to each other. Yoi. Either you listen to me or you go out. Ah. Now, firstly, you must be orderly in that also. Just like you are sitting in a nice order, one must be in order here. Because otherwise, it becomes like the next slide, which is not a crystal. Murli is not working, no? Ah, this is not a crystal. So when you're just making a noise, it looked like this. So the difference between crystal and not a crystal is something like this. And something wrong with this pointer, Muli. Why don't you give me that laptop? I will, I will operate it from here. Please keep it away. Okay, now what's this? If that's a crystal and this is not a crystal, what do you think this one is? This is how a crystal looks as it is forming. You know, things are getting together. Because crystals usually form from solution and all that, where everything is totally wild and scattered. So it's got to come together and be in that regular arrangement. It cannot happen by magic. Actually, how the crystal comes together is also a type of chemical reaction. How these things come together and how they arrange themselves properly. So this is really a kind of a crystal being formed. Okay. Now let's go on. And so the three crystals I want to talk to you today about are three very common substances which we know of in everyday life. At least two of them we know in everyday life. The third one I don't know. Maybe we know a little bit about it in everyday life. But the first two certainly we know a lot about these things. 
and they are all crystals and uh, salt is the first one I want to talk about is essential for life we call it common salt or sodium chloride it comes in many different forms and shapes you can see that regular thing on the left hand side the purple one and the one below are all forms of sodium chloride that are grown under slightly different conditions but it's all sodium chloride all right the color by the way is because of some impurities which get into the crystal now this is how you make it I don't know how many of you people have seen a salt pan actually somewhere how many of you have actually seen a salt pan very good very good so any of you who have grown up near the coast sea coast you would have seen this India has got a very long coastline and we have got a very hot climate so it is the easiest thing in the world to make salt in the from the sea but I don't know those of you who have seen the salt pans do you know that that liquid over there in the salt pan is not at all colored white it is colored some kind of a brownish black or something it looks like a very dirty color that brine is actually quite impure it contains lots of things and out of this you imagine out of all this mucky stuff you get these crystals nice and white and pure so crystallization or the formation of crystals is a purifying technique from an impure thing you get a pure thing and this is the essence of crystallization it's also one of the mysteries how does it almost purify itself in coming out of this brine so there's got to be some reason why the sodium and the chloride they like each other better than all the other things in the brine so these are all mysteries that have still not been solved anyway if you move on a little bit here is a form of salt which is it's actually a French name fleur de sel means flowers of salt and it's a very what shall I say expensive kind of salt that is sold especially in Europe and America for all sorts of gourmet cooking it is the very fine feathers of sodium chloride that come in the first crystallization from the salt pans when the weather is very hot only then this flood the cell will come out of the brine and it doesn't look like ordinary sodium chloride crystals it looks like feathers that's why it's called flowers flowers of salt so it's almost like in the first you get this stuff then they take it off very carefully and then they sell it at a very expensive price apparently it tastes better they say we don't know it could be a marketing thing but people are willing to pay money quite a lot of money to buy this special kind of salt now salt is not found only from the sea this is another variety of salt which comes from salt mines now these salt mines are not frequently found throughout the world they are found in parts of North India and Pakistan practically these are the only places where they are found this salt is kind of special the yellow color the blue or the pink color which is found in these things it adds to the taste this is certainly available in Bangalore by the way it's available in shops and most interestingly they say about this salt which is obtained from mines rather than from the sea most of you in this audience happily are too young to know about something called blood pressure but people who are slightly older will know about something called blood pressure and how if you eat more salt your blood pressure is supposed to go up which is very bad for you they say when you eat salt which is from the mines it doesn't affect the blood pressure changes so much as sea salt this is what they say and this is one of the reasons why this salt from the mine is touted and they say it's something better 
This is black salt or kala namak. And this of course has a very peculiar, nice taste. And it is used in chat and all these things. And this color, this black color actually comes from iron sulfide which is in the sodium chloride. It's like an intergrowth, two things in one. So when I say that crystallization is purifying and it brings it out, sometimes when this imposter compound is of a very clever type, it can go into the sodium chloride. So iron sulfide is like that. It gives it its color and because iron sulfide will hydrolyze to give H2S, it gives that peculiar smell and taste of kala namak. So you see in this simple sodium chloride, there are many, many things going on. Okay, this is another thing, salt. The dandi much, it is, salt also becomes politically very significant. When Gandhiji did this march, there was a great symbolic value and many people say it was the turning point in our freedom struggle. Salt is something that affects the most common person. You cannot, you see you can live without sugar, my second crystal, but you cannot live without salt. If you go totally without salt, after some time you will collapse and die. You cannot actually manage without salt. So, the salt is, is very, very essential compound for you. And this is of course the familiar so-called crystal structure of sodium chloride which I am sure some of you have seen in the textbooks. But what I want to tell you is, is the first idea I want to give you about crystals. You look at the shape of that unit cell of sodium chloride with red and purple spheres corresponding to chloride and sodium. You see the shape of that unit cell is translated into the shape of that big crystal of salt on the right hand side. That means the little one inside is a good model for the big macro crystal outside. So if you take these little unit cells and go on placing them next to next in three dimensions, you will get the big crystal. And therefore, the corollary is that if you take the three sides of a cube, the angle between them is 90 degrees, no? So just like that, the angles between the faces of the big sodium chloride crystal are also 90 degrees. So what is true in the micro sense is true in the macro sense. So this is something that is, you should watch for and this helps us also in understanding and studying crystals at a higher level. Now coming a little bit to crystallography, here is Lawrence Bragg who first found out the internal structure of sodium chloride. Many of you will know that he is the youngest man to ever have been given a Nobel Prize in the science subjects. He was about 22 when he got this Nobel Prize. Before he got any position, any permanent position, he never got a lecturer job, but he got the Nobel Prize before that. Which means if you make a discovery which is sufficiently big, people are there to recognize you. And it's too complicated in the course of this lecture to tell you how exactly he did it, but he did it using some basic physics and geometry principles which were available to him at that time. So sodium chloride also becomes the first chemical compound whose crystal structure was determined by the technique of X-ray diffraction. You take X-rays and hit it on a crystal, you get what is called a diffraction pattern which is shown on that top left hand corner and using that diffraction pattern, you can figure out that sodium is here, chloride is there, sodium is there, etc. So that's what Bragg did and that's why we still remember him more than 100 years after he made this discovery. Now we come to the second crystal, sugar. Now. <clears throat> Sugar is a slightly more complicated molecule than salt. And there it is dancing around. But the formation of sugar crystals from molasses is roughly the same. If you have been to a, seen molasses, it is again a dark brown, almost blackish color. So out of this molasses comes this wonderful white crystals of sugar. And so again the miracle is, how, do you, how does it purify itself? 
literally how does it purify itself out of this whole junk in the molasses and why do we get only these crystals ah now come on now tell me which one among all these do you like the best all all huh <laughs> tough to choose no do all of you know what all of them are I think I like chiroti the best. I think. How about you? Which one? Who? How many people like rava kesari the best here? Not so many. How about peni? Peni. Nobody knows what it is. Good. See, some of these sweets are vanishing. Actually, I find. You know, we are all eating some ice creams and also all kind of things. I know. some cake bake all these things these sweets are all much tastier so please go back and you know try and sample some of these things so sugar you know is a sugar okay is, is not like salt it's not essential for life but it makes life very much more pleasant okay so life is not all about just living and quietly working and doing you also must have some enjoyment so along with sugar you need salt that is why we have all the tastes are mixing in our cooking sugar salt bitter spicy everything you need little little nothing too much so that's right please enjoy all these things quietly ha huh. this one yeah yeah this is better this is this better than all the ones in the previous one now <clears throat> see this is a very very special form of sugar it's a very very special form of sugar because you see when you see it being made that thing spins no at very fast you can hardly see it when that thing is spinning you cannot see the sugar it's also quite hot inside i don't know if you seen the guy making it that one becomes quite hot it is spinning very fast and then he puts the stick over there and suddenly it starts forming round it then he goes on doing it now look this form of sugar is not a crystal at all you know sorry to disappoint you but it is not a crystal it is what is called amorphous you know that second slide i so showed you all the people just roaming around like how you all were all chatting in the beginning ah like that so this is that form of sugar where all the molecules are all you know stuck up here and there everywhere not in an orderly fashion now why do we want amorphous things have you ever noticed that when you eat this the sweet taste seems to be much more than when you eat that poli am i not right the moment you put it to your tongue it starts tasting extremely sweet now why does that happen because it is amorphous because it is not regular all the molecules are quite angry so the moment you put a little bit of liquid on it they like to come out of that angry state and go into solution and that's why it tastes sweeter because it dissolves much much faster many amorphous things dissolve faster than crystalline things and so now what's the application of all this you know today there are many many people in the pharmaceutical side pharmaceutical industry who want to take these drugs and make them in an amorphous form and you can easily understand why now because i already told you the answer suppose the crystalline drug is not very soluble in the tablet suppose you give it in the amorphous form and it is dissolving much faster hmm is it not much better bangalore is a place where many people have asthma Ah, regrettably now you are taking a medicine and it takes half an hour to take effect and suppose i give you the same medicine which will take effect in 5 minutes which one will you prefer 5 minutes definitely so people do want to make drugs in an amorphous form it's a very challenging thing because these amorphous crystals are very amorphous forms are very nice but they rapidly change into the crystal form because they are not very stable and i don't know how many of you 
have actually gone to this fellow shop and seen that stuff after 10, 15 minutes if nobody buys it. How many of you have done that? Ah, then you will find the whole thing has kind of collapsed and it is somewhat shrunken. So it doesn't last for very long. So it comes, at that point you should enjoy and then go away. So in the same way, the medicine also is put in the amorphous form for the same reason. The moment it is ingested, it goes into the system, starts working. So this is what we do with amorphous forms of crystals. Now let's move along. Okay, now I told you about enjoying and sweets and all that. There are some people who are not supposed to eat sweets. And I talked about blood pressure, now I'll talk about diabetes. So this is again, uh, very luckily, something that most of you in the audience don't have to worry about. But you know something, India has got one of the largest proportion of diabetics in the world. And so this is a serious health problem. And I'm sure you all know that uh, disease of diabetes is connected somehow with this huge complicated molecule called insulin. And in diabetes there are two types, type 1 where the body cannot produce insulin and type 2 where the body is resistant to insulin. The insulin which is produced in the body cannot act. So it results in a serious metabolic problem and it is a life threatening disease if you do not take care of it properly. Now this insulin, I mean, you see I am taking salt which is a very simple humble molecule. Then I am taking sugar, sucrose which is a moderately small molecule. Now insulin is a huge molecule but this insulin also crystallizes. It crystallizes in the same regular way of salt and sugar. And it was discovered almost 80 years ago that insulin forms crystals and that these crystals also will diffract x-rays. And from this diffraction pattern, you can determine the crystal structure of insulin. Now, because insulin is such a huge molecule, it is very, very difficult to determine the crystal structure using x-rays. And this person here on the left hand side, a very famous lady called Dorothy Hodgkin, who determined this crystal structure of insulin. And to solve this problem, you know, boys and girls, she took not one year or two years or 10 years, but 30 years. She started this around 1935 and she finished the project around 1965 in the course of which she did many other important things. But this insulin thing was, she often says, it is the really the story of her life, how she did the crystal structure of insulin. And Professor Hodgkin is generally considered by many to be one of the greatest scientists who lived in the previous century. And I was privileged enough to see her about two or three occasions. And I must tell you, she's a very, very humble lady. And considering she got a Nobel Prize and all that, it did made the least difference to her, nothing. She will still talk about something. And I must tell you, she was, for those of us who knew her little, she was a very good mother, a very good wife, a very good daughter. And this the last one is very surprising. She was a very good daughter-in-law also. She had an aged mother-in-law and she always used to go and take care of her all the time. Even when she was very, very busy, she was all sorts of, you know, huge positions and all she was occupying. She is an extremely good role model for all the girls in the audience. Please read about her and her life and all the challenges that she had to go through in achieving what she did. And at the end of the day, she solved problems which were extremely difficult. One of these was insulin. And in fact, here is a whole collage about her work. They even gave a stamp in the UK where they have her face on it. And these are all the so many things that she has done. And she has inspired so many generations of crystallographers. And uh, so truly she belongs to the whole community. So this is Dorothy Hodgkin. And so I want you to think a little bit about some of the pioneers who came before us. Hey. Now the third one. Oh, wow, what is this? Which diamond? Ah, good, good, good. 
never forget this name Kohinoor <coughs> because it belonged to us and it was taken away and uh, yes so this is the third crystal which I want to talk about <coughs> it has probably inspired more wars and violence and intrigues plots than sugar and salt so crystals also crystal is supposed to have an effect diamond is supposed to be you know brings good luck bad luck they say Kohinoor brings bad luck they say that whoever has the Kohinoor loses their empire so I don't know whether we really want it back or not you know let them keep it and lose their empire fully already they have lost it most of it so maybe they will lose it fully if they go on uh, clinging on to it so this is diamond yes and uh, you should know this is where it used to sit you know many years ago in the red fort in Delhi in the big peacock throne that belonged to this man uh, actually it came from Deccan it came from <coughs> near Hyderabad and then of course it went there it went to the peacock throne then it went to Nadir Shah in Persia then it came to Afghanistan and uh, then when the Afghan fellow Shah Shuja was losing his empire then he gave it to Ranjit Singh in Lahore in exchange for his life and so Ranjit Singh had it for a few years and then in 1857 the British took it away from him so it's a long and complicated story about this stone and uh, certainly it has captured the imagination of many people all over the world now diamond again like salt and sugar it has got a regular structure you know perfectly symmetrical structure with a tetrahedral carbon and uh, here I am tempted to digress slightly and tell you a little story you know all of you I am sure even in the school 8th class you have read of different forms of carbon no diamond and graphite you all know so graphite is a, another form of carbon they call it allotrope or something no you have heard that word all of you know that diamond and graphite are two different forms of carbon okay so allotrope is an old word now in uh, modern language we use the word polymorph polymorph means different form a different crystal form different crystal form of the same chemical substance is called polymorph so diamond and graphite are two different polymorphic forms of the element carbon and I am reminded of graphite because of this what this young man just told us what was your name who, who spoke about Napoleon huh? you spoke what's your name Bharat See, Bharat told us a nice story about chemistry and Napoleon so and how he said chemistry is useless I think he really believed that one because I'll tell you what happened to Napoleon chemistry finally got the better of him do you know the story about Napoleon how he you said you mentioned about Russia also no he invaded Russia in the winter ah, no, but you don't you don't know the connection between this and polymorphism ah see he said chemistry he said Napoleon he said Russia but he never said the most important thing that is polymorph now what is the connection between polymorph diamond and Napoleon and Russia and all these things I mean you may be wondering what is this guy talking about now look you are all chemistry you like chemistry you say so if you go in the periodic table below carbon what is the next one silicon, silicon. below silicon germanium I want more voices below germanium which one huh? arsenic, arsenic. No. No. carbon silicon germanium ah. see look all these things must come just like that you know you cannot be hesitating so much carbon silicon germanium it should just come like that quickly it should come not slowly now this tin I am interested in this tin 
because you see if you take this crystal structure of diamond and if you replace the carbon atoms with silicon then you get the silicon crystal because silicon also in group 4 no same quadrivalency same as carbon so crystal structure of tin of silicon is just the same except that the cube becomes bigger size then if you go to germanium it becomes even bigger still same crystal structure and then if you go to tin still the same crystal structure you get a form of tin which is called gray tin gray tin gray tin has the same crystal structure as diamond so it just looks like diamond except that the whole thing becomes much bigger now you also know because you say you like chemistry that as you go down the periodic table within the same period metallic character increases no ah uh, am i not right as you go down down the metallic character starts going up so by the time you come to tin tin has some characteristics of a non metal gray tin and it has some characteristics of a metal that is white tin now white tin looks like other metals only shiny and all gray tin looks like some gray dust so these are two different forms of tin with different crystal structure and if you think about white tin what the crystal structure of white tin looks like it just looks like this gray tin but if you just squash it down in one direction so the other two look like the same and then you press it down a little bit you get the structure of white tin you see what is this connection with napoleon in those days when the soldiers were going about the buttons in their coats used to be made of tin and obviously they will use the metallic form of tin namely white tin so the soldiers went from france wearing these coats with the buttons of white tin now i think you know where the story is going they went into the russian winter napoleon didn't like chemistry so he did not know one important thing about white tin that at about a temperature between 10 to 12 degrees white tin becomes gray tin uh so the moment they started going through that cold cold russia these buttons started disintegrating so all these fellows were standing with the coats all coming out so they started freezing much faster so you see finally chemistry did napoleon in in the end so i don't know whether you knew this story when you talked about napoleon and russia and all that so you can see not not paying attention to science can get you into lots of trouble hmm and so napoleon he didn't realize all these things of course many people say this is only a story some learned people are still sitting and discussing in europe whether this is true whether this is not true i mean scientists we need something to some research problem we need so we will take this as a problem and we'll say okay let us figure out there are many learned people who say this never happened many other equally learned people say this happened but it's certainly a very good story and since uh, you mentioned it i couldn't resist telling you this story because it is again connected with the diamond crystal structure of course diamond doesn't have a metallic form because carbon is too high in the periodic table so is the hope diamond another famous diamond uh oh, by the way i should tell you all the diamonds in the world came from india till 200 years ago no other place in the world had diamonds it is only in the last 200 years the diamonds were found in south africa and russia and other places this is the hope diamond this is the orlov diamond which was for many years until it was stolen in the ranganatha swami temple in sri rangam in tamil nadu it's now sitting in the kremlin this koinur again yeah actually in the end i don't think we want it let them keep it and but still we put it on our stamp which was uh, brought out in 2014 to celebrate the international year of crystallography and here are two things which are very peculiar to india 
One is the Kohinoor diamond. The second behind is a molecule of curcumin, which is the active principle in haldi or turmeric. And so both these have, things have got a strong Indian connection. And coming to diamond, I told you it was originally found in this part of the country. A Kohinoor actually was mined somewhere here in this region, Golconda in Hyderabad. And this brings me to the very last part of my talk that uh, about six, seven months from now in August, we're going to have a very big meeting in Hyderabad where about 2,000 to 3,000 crystallographers from all over the world will be coming. So Golconda may not be, uh, um, Kohinoor may not be coming back to Hyderabad, but certainly all the crystals, crystal people are coming. And so this is the meeting really, which is, I just wanted to tell you a few things about it. And uh, here is this organization called International Union of Crystallography, where India has been a member for the last 70 years. But this is the first time that this body is meeting in India. So it's a very, very big occasion for all people who are interested in crystals. And so if you are interested, you should go to this web page and look at all the things that are going to happen here. And this is where it's going to be held in a very big convention center in Hyderabad. Huh, I told you about sodium chloride. So here is a young man called Dr. Crickle, Robert Crickle in Austria, who built the largest model of the sodium chloride crystal in the world. And you can check up this fellow and his model on the uh, internet. And we are very lucky that we are going to be able to bring him and his model to Hyderabad. So this thing will be exhibited in the Congress and he's very happy to come and uh, show the model and he's actually going to talk about how he built this model also. And so you can actually look at the crystal, you can go and touch it, feel it. Please still please see the same 90 degree angles are there between the three faces of the sodium chloride crystal. Same thing in that small, that crystal, everything same. So sodium chloride does not change no matter what you try to do with it. So this one will be there. And uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Murli Krishna told you about Facebook. This is my Facebook ID and I'm constantly talking about scientific matters for young and not so young, for everybody. And those of you who are into the social media and all, please look. And also I want to make an announcement to BSc students here especially. We are indeed looking for student volunteers for this Congress. So if you are a BSc student, I think school students are still too young, but we're looking at plus two. Plus two students we are looking at. Uh, we basically want, but this is not a problem in this audience, we're looking for basic fluency and competence in speaking English because about 2,000, 3,000 people will come and about half of them cannot speak English very well. They can't understand English very well. So volunteers will be required to answer questions and do this and that. You know, in plus two or in BSc and all that, you all will probably be all far too young to really understand what the talks are all about. But it will give you a feeling for what a really big world-class international scientific congress looks like. The Congress lasts for about seven, eight days. So if you all are able to get permission, we can give you official invitation letters and all those things so that you can be given proper leave by your schools or colleges to come here. But this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So, and Hyderabad is really not very far off from here. So if any of you are interested to participate in this, just send me, use Facebook Messenger at this handle and send me a message then somebody in the Congress organization will get back to you. Already we have many requests and we have already accepted about 20, 30 people as volunteers from schools and colleges all over India, actually. You know, there are some people who are coming from as far away from Assam. We have accepted them for the Congress already. So it has already evoked a large, a large amount of interest. You don't have to understand science and all to just see how scientists operate, how they do, what are the things we are up to, you know. And so this will be a nice and valuable opportunity for those of you who are interested in something like this.
So this is about what I wanted to tell you. And I hope you got the message that science is meant for all. It's meant for students. It is meant for general public. It's meant for young people. It is meant for old people. Science really changes the way in which you think. And it makes you a much more logical, systematic person. It throws away things like superstitions and mumbo jumbo and all this kind of thing, which is very, very important. So you can see even simple things, salt, sugar and all that. They have got to be deep scientific basis. And so it's very important to keep this kind of a scientific background. It doesn't matter that, you know, tomorrow you are not going to study science, you don't have to do PhD and all these things. No. Doesn't mean that if you study science, you'll have to do PhD. Just be aware that there is something called science. Just like on the other hand, science students should be aware that there is something called humanities and social sciences and liberal arts. Both these things are required. I think what I'm finding nowadays, I was very, very happy <coughs> when I came now and I was talking uh, to the principal and the other colleagues. They said there seems to be a real interest among young people and students to study science subjects as a first priority. You know, and this is very important and it's very nice to hear because for the last 20, 30 years, I've been seeing this mad, mad, crazy, crazy rush to become engineers. When you don't even know what it is and getting into these crazy coaching classes to get into these crazy IITs. Stop it. It's not worth it. I can tell you in 1969, I qualified for that IIT with a very high rank and I went and did BSc in St. Xavier's College in Bombay, chemistry. So I told you I only want to do chemistry. No, 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 don't clap. Don't clap. I don't, I don't want any claps. You, I want you fellows. See, what made me do that? I got a very, very high rank. They thought, but actually in those days, nobody thought I was crazy. Certainly not my parents. They said, ah, okay, if this is what you want to do, do. About five years ago, I heard one lady in Calcutta, her son got into IIT, but he never accepted. So she went and committed suicide. Ah, no, this, this crazy thing has to stop. And for those parents in the audience, I think I see a few of them. Please let us cry halt to this bluff. This is really bad, it's injurious, you know. Because most of these people who are going for these engineering degrees, the other day Pranab Mukherjee called, he said, he inaugurated the function in Presidency College. He said, IIT graduates have become highly paid detergent sellers. So please think what you all are doing. It's your own life. Just because your parents told you or something, I'll commit suicide, okay, go and commit suicide. Nobody can hold you to ransom like that, I say. You do what you feel like doing. You want chemistry, physics, astronomy. Whatever you want to do, you do. Please think for yourself because now the whole thing is opening up. This country is changing. It's changing very fast. And no more people are able to run away to America. That's another thing. Some do something, 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 then run away to America. Now America doesn't want us. Uh, then where do we go? Moldavia? No, no, where we will go? Bangladesh? Any foreign country is better than India. No, no. no. This, not, not okay. Not okay. Look, I got my PhD in America, which I like to badmouth so much. I got a green card there also, which I gave up at the age of 26 and came back. Ah, don't clap. Don't clap. Don't clap. No, not, not required. Not, no, not required. Not required. So still, still I'm standing, no? Ah, I still I'm standing, not dead. So what happened to me in India? Nothing happened. I'm still talking about salt, sugar, diamond and all. Do I look like somebody who is very sad? No. Then, so please, please use your brains which God gave you and make correct decisions for yourself and don't worry about other things. Like I told you in the beginning, if you do what you like to do, then nobody can stop you. Okay? Thank you all very much.
with uh, are any queries you want to discuss with sir you can now i request uh, dr b m nagbushan and dr a nagaratta madam to present a memento to professor g r dev like it you will do well that's true for any subject if you like engineering do engineering i mean do what you like to do it's no more scary or less scary than anything else there no no stigma need be associated with studying science subject there is no stigma in doing bsc msc if you do it well for that matter there is no stigma attached in doing anything if you do it well go to a good college first go to a college which is reputed and there are still i would say older colleges which are slightly better some of the central institutions have started these undergraduate programs but the intake is still relatively small so i don't know i mean i don't know what I mean, there are some parents here and so on i am a strong advocate of children living with their parents for as long as possible i think this going off to hostels and all at an early age is really not required so if you can get the best college you can get within an easy distance of your house you please go there because the advantages of staying at home are very many and uh, i agree that see it's better to go to a good college and do bsc than go to a bad college and do some engineering or something really it is you know i have seen so many cases of people who finish this iit and then they are saying they are miserable and then they actually came over to pure sciences after 5 years in btech especially people who are passionate about mathematics i have found so many of them and they said that they got into this iit thing very easily because they could score high in maths and physics but they said they hated every minute of it and the first chance they could get they jumped back into maths maths also has that kind of fascination for people who really like it so i would think that the first thing is to look for a good college which those whom you know have spoken about properly and uh, the institute also has a ug program which has started 4 5 years ago i think we take only about 120 students every year so it's a very small number these new institutions called icers i don't know if you've heard about them but to get into the icer you have to clear that iit exam and they did something very wrong there they said the lower ranks of iit can get into icer for science so almost they are telling you that if you are not so good then you can do science so i don't i don't like the implication of that uh, although now they do tell me some of my friends in icer tell me that people who are scoring the higher ranks in iit are opting for icer and doing science but that whole iit exam itself is like some mickey mouse exam it It, it doesn't test anything actually, and I've you know I've been in this line for 40 years now. And let me tell you something very clear and honest. The person who is coming first in the class at the 12th class or BSc and all that, more often than not, 
is not the best researcher 20 years, 30 years from then. He is not. He or she is not. I have found many reasons for this. And since you ask me, I can tell you. If you want to do science, and if you want to do research especially, I found that there are two qualities that God has to give you. You get it only by birth. You can't get it by studying or listening or looking at other people. And what are these two qualities? The first is curiosity. You got to be curious about everything. There's nothing that, you know, you should not be curious about. You know, I, it's hard to express, but some people, you see, are naturally curious. They want to go on asking questions about sometimes even stupid things. If you've got that quality, which nobody can give you, only God can give you, then stick to it. You may be meant for science. The second quality which I find you need is raw courage. You should not be scared. You should not be scared of questioning 10 people if you feel that you are correct. But you must really know that you are correct. Huh? Man, many Indians have this habit of fighting with other people when they are not really sure of themselves. Ah, if you do all those things, then they are hopeless. But once you are sure you are correct, then you should have the courage to say, this is what I think it is and I am sure that this is what it is. This quality also I find, it doesn't come from parents or teachers or books or all other things you can study. All other things you can gather on your own later on. And why do I say that this first fellow, second fellow who comes in the class is not good? This IIT exam and other things, they train you to be docile. Go on cramming thousand things. And you are told that if you learn these thousand things, you will score in that IIT. If you learn that thousand and one thing which is not there in the exam, no, no need. Whereas a curious person will want to know, why am I studying only thousand? Why I should not study that thousand and one thing? So those who are not curious and those who are not courageous score very high in that IIT exam. They are very, e they very easily drilled. Docile they become. They become like walking zombies. They are good at passing that exam and nothing else in the world. And you see, these are the very two traits which are essential to do research. Courage and curiosity. The IIT fellow has neither. So, you see, uh, <laughs> you have to decide which type you are. And above all to the parents here, I'll tell you, if you find that your child is of that second type, don't push him into this IIT engineering route. It's not meant for him or her, but he or she will naturally shine in pure sciences and research. Science is all about, you know, going there, having some fun, doing something, seeing what is happening. You know, you draw a picture of a chapati, you color it blue. No chapati is blue, but you want to color it blue. So then you say, what's wrong with the blue chapati? Somebody who asks questions like this is meant for science. Somebody who says, no, 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 how can a chapati be blue? It has to be only brown. So you go for IIT. <laughs> Got it? Okay. 